todas, todes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Judith Flores Carmona, the Interim Director of Chicano Programs. Gracias for joining us from wherever you are at and those that, that made it to the in-person event. Um, thank you. Welcome to my second home, or my home rather, the Honors College. I'm very excited about today's event because a while back, actually 10 years ago, I first met Roberto Lovato and I was extremely inspired by his work um, that he was doing and his conversation and talk he gave at Hampshire College when I was doing a postdoc in Massachusetts long ago. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background for, for this speaker series and what we're doing. Um, in my role as the interim director of Chicano programs, I envisioned programming that served and addressed the needs of the whole student, mind, body, and spirit. And I also envisioned my role to serve as a bridge and collaborate between student support services and the academic side of things. Mm -hmm. The speakers that we have invited so far since last year uh, have presented their critical scholarship and have posited uh, urgent questions that we need to answer as a Hispanic minority serving institution and as a land grant institution. As you all might know, it is Latinx Heritage Month or Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, we are right in the, in the second week of it. Um, and the Latinx communities that we represent, that we embody, that we um, experience are not homogeneous because there is in fact vast diversity that we represent and also many issues and topics that we experience, not only in academia, but in our comunidades as well. And we carry with us what Tara also terms our community cultural wealth. So I really wanted the speakers to be assets based, uh, positive based, um, but also to get us thinking and asking critical questions that we need to, to ask during these, these times um, at the political and sociocultural level. So we started with this um, speaker series last fall, in fall 2020, and we hosted various speakers, and you're welcome to check out our website, chicano.nmsu.edu, and you'll see all the recordings there. I want to thank Jonathan Moreno for his fabulous work um, with technology. I don't know what I would do without him, and I'm going to miss him when he graduates. Um, I really want you to, ex uh, from this talk, um, really nuance some of the, the, the diversity, like I said, that we embody, but also the issues as they are connected to the Borderlands region and as an HSI institution. So uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Otakuye Conroy Ben, who is Lakota, coming from ASU, and she'll be talking about what it means and what her experience has been being an Indigenous scholar in STEM. That's October 11th, which is also Indigenous Peoples Day, and that will be a virtual event. I need to um, do a land acknowledgement, um, and I invite all of you who are watching us to do the same. I, Judy Flores Carmona, am honored to live and work as a guest in the land of the Southwest, Southwest Indigenous Peoples, including the Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache. I acknowledge and respect the sovereign Indian nations and indigenous peoples of this land. As a Mexicana, formerly undocumented border crosser, I reflexively honor Native American knowledges and world views. I invite each of you to also acknowledge the lands on which you stand and from where you're connecting with us today. And I also want us to take a moment to recognize the suffering that is ex being experienced, not only across the country, but in the world. Uh, and lastly, before I, I introduce you to um, doc, uh, Dr. Schultz, I would like to uh, thank our support <laughs> collaborators, um, the American Indian programs, Black Programs, the Office of the Vice President of Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity, the College of Arts and Sciences, Stan Fulton and Dow Chair, and Dean Fem Camarena, Dean of the Honors College. Muchas gracias for your support. I will now turn it over to Dr. Teresa Maria Linda Schultz to introduce our guest. Okay. Uh, buenas tardes, good afternoon. Casi son buenas noches, pero ahorita son tardes. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Um, Roberto Lovato is the author of Unforgetting a Memoir of Family, Migration, Gangs, and Revolution in the Americas. 
a memoir picked by the New York Times as an editor's choice. The paper also held the book as groundbreaking, a kaleidoscope montage that is at once a family saga, a coming of age story, and a meditation on the vicissitudes of history, community, and most of all for Lovato identity. Newsweek listed Lovato's memoir as a must read 2020 book, and the Los Angeles Times listed it as one of its 20 best books of 2020. Lovato is an educator, journalist, and writer based at the Writer's Grotto in San Francisco, California. As a co-founder of Hashtag Dignidad Literaria, he helped build a movement advocating for equity and literary justice for more than 60 million Latinx persons left off of bookshelves in the United States and out of the national dialogue. A recipient of a reporting grant from the Pulitzer Center, Lovato has reported on numerous issues, including violence, terrorism, the drug war, and the refugee crisis. For Mexico, Venezuela, El Salvador, Dominican Republic, Haiti, France, and the United States, among other countries. Es un placer, it is with great pleasure that I present Mr. Roberto Lovato. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Schultz, and thank you, Judith, for uh, even remembering me. Uh, I remember you, and you were the same height, but uh, a student. Now your stature is higher, but it's it's your 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 persona stature that it's higher. You're still the same height. Um. So yeah, pretty soon we're gonna have. Is there a word for like being heightest? You're ageist, you're sexist. Is it, I, don't know, I hope I'm not being that, but uh, it's my pleasure to be with all of you, especially those of you here. This is my first live event in a university. I am extremely excited and, and glad to be back, man. I miss human beings. <laughs> Zoom has its limits. I'm sorry to all of you watching, but there's nothing like human contact to, to really animate a speaker, I think. So... It's my honor to be here with you, and uh, thank you all for organizing it. I have more ground than we have time to cover today. I already sensed that, so I'm going to speed through certain things. So we have a little bit of a chance to dialogue, perhaps. And um, so, you know, when I was looking at what the Pluri University was the concept and what you were doing, I thought, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about unforgetting, uh, but I'm also going to talk about things I have in forthcoming books. Like I have a book that I've started working on called Letters to a Young Poet Warrior. And it's kind of my way of communicating what I've learned as a, not just as a writer or journalist, but also as a, an activist. You'll see what I mean when, when I hear what I'm doing. And, um, and you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the Southwest at the border and everything. And, you know, looking at your priority and focus, I thought it would be good to share this tradition that I, I, I'm trying to channel into the United States, which is a Latin American tradition. And those of scholars and students among you know that any tradition is a constructed. There's no such thing as an official God gave the Ten Commandments tradition to feel sorry if I'm offending any Christians and Catholics out there, but I I don't roll with, with, with the untruth of any one tradition. So um, I thought, yeah, you know, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about this poet warrior tradition, and uh, I want to share it with you. So with that, if I may, I'll, I'll yeah. today's agenda, I'm going to talk about you know, an introduction, who am I, why the hell am I here, and then uh, a little bit about unforgetting my book and my effort to translate the poet warrior tradition into the English language, because I learned it in Espanol, and then uh, the history of the tradition in Espanol, and then a little bit about people I see embodying this tradition in the United States, in English. And some closing thoughts. Introduction. So, who am I? I'm the son of Maria Elena and Ramon Lovato, two working class immigrants from El Salvador. Uh, it came in the uh, early 50s, and they landed in San Francisco's Mission District, right down near 24th. They, we had an apartment down the street from the projects on 25th and Folsom, and uh, had a house full of immigrant 
it's an immigrant family. Only me and my brother Ramon, who lives here in New Mexico, were born in the U.S. And one of my brothers, Omar, our oldest brother, went to school with the guy there on the... I don't know if you see him. Do you know who that is? Carlos Santana. You're a Californian, obviously, so you're using your advantages. Yeah, my brother went to school with Carlos Santana. And, and, and Santana, everybody loves Santana's music around the world. Anywhere I travel around the world, I want to, I learned, I realized I could get a shortcut to get along with people. I said, hey, man, my brother went to school with Santana. Boom. So then, but, but it reflects a lot about the beauty and the power of his music re reflects a moment in San Francisco Mission District history where it was, one, I would argue, one of the most dynamic and in visionary communities in the United States in the 60s and 70s in particular, when it was a Latino majority place and not a, a hub for Airbnb that it is now. So um, that's me there at the bottom. And I don't know, I just thought I would put my first lowrider there on the left, uh, uh, a Merc, my old Merc that I had. I had a Monte Carlos and I junked all of them. And I don't know, I just, my, my parents were, uh, like I said, working class, and um, actually, to talk about that, I want to do a contest. I'll give uh, this book to anybody who can guess it. Some of you may have read it. If somebody read it, you'll be able to win the contest, but you can't participate. All right, it's a contest. Are we ready? All right, so free book for anybody who can guess why I grew up with what Shakespeare called rich eyes and poor hands. Right? And that's a picture of the projects down the street from where I grew up. So you would have to have read the book to know this, so I, I'm going to keep my book, I think. Or Anybody want to fathom a... No, you don't know me yet, so you can't... The beauty around you, art. You get a couple of pages of the book for that <laughs> lovely answer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, that's good. Well, the the reason I have as, as a... I grew up having rich eyes and poor hands was because my mother was a maid with Hyatt Regency Hotel where I used to go clean with her. And my father was a janitor with United Airlines, which meant what for me as a kid? Discount, hotel rooms, free airline tickets. Grew up right in front of the project, but traveled around the world with my mom and my abuelita. So that kind of makes me a Kind of a freak in a lot of ways because I go all these exotic places but come back to the gladiator life of San Francisco's mission and then run the projects. So again it gave me a different perspective and it's uh um the place we most traveled to was El Salvador. I'm sorry nobody won the book but we'll maybe have another chance for something else. So uh, okay here's another here's a anybody want to guess what my travels around our big beautiful earth taught me? Hint. It has something to do with this pic. This satellite pic. Anybody want to guess what this satellite pic is of? Look, Mom, no border in Del Rio, Texas, from outer space, or deep history. In history and in space, there's no border. I, when I teach, you know, I, I, I'm a co-founder of the country's first Central American Studies program at Cal State Northridge. I'm a recovering ac academic, so, um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I, I was a bootleg chair. I don't have a PhD. I have a master's, but I did everything a chair does except go to a bank with the fat checks that you all go to with. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I know the wages in the academy. I'm entirely being, but what I learned in my travels was that the border is a construct. A machete of memory, as I talk about in the book, it's a machete of memory designed to both erase history and divide families and entire peoples. And you have a machete like the ones I grew up with, and there's next to it equals, and there's the U.S. border. The border is a machete that cuts off families, that separates the uh, United States from its complicity with the most nefarious forces in the Americas, right, which I've seen firsthand. The borders, I've also learned that the borders are illusory, political theater designed to reinforce illusory identities that create and defend another illusion, national security. Right? These are all illusory concepts. They're not, they're not real in a material sense. They are manufactured. They're ideas. You can't touch, smell, or 
or taste and identity, right? And so you have these, you know, I know the Border Patrol really well. I've been looking at them for 30 years, and I know how they've graduated into a, what I call a communications force that's also kind of a, a, a an agent of violence, right? So that they're very sophisticated, and what they did with the Haitian community and migrants in Del Rio was a performance designed to generate certain effects, including bring pressure on Biden, who's not exactly great on immigration, if anybody here doesn't know. Um, so um, I, that's what my, my travels have taught me, that the identities built around borders are, are illusory as well, and they're very, they can be very dangerous, as this picture from Texas, uh, the border. I've been all across the border. I've been into Sonora Desert. I visited mass grave sites across 2,500 miles from El Salvador to the United States. And the, uh, the creation of the mass graves by different governments transcends parties in all states. So that Barack Obama helped build massive mass graves by pushing, militarizing the border and pushing children and mothers to their deaths, up to 3,000 according to Homeland Security statistics. I've also learned that all of us, even the most challenged and humble among us, can and must destroy the dangerous border illusions in our minds. I've, you could look at my life that I'm going to tell you about as a form of kind of trying to realize and live that. And there's a child at the border beating up a piñata of the border, which I love. And so I've also learned that we need a poetic sense to create a lot, what in poetry is called a line break. A pause in the false stories we're fed. So that, you know, when all a line break is, is a, the end of a line, so that you start a new line. But it, when you put a line break in a poem, you're slowing things down. And I think the rapid pace of change allows for the illusions of, say, the Republican Party and Donald Trump to, to create because of the speed with which people are getting information and getting false information. In the same way the Democrats do it on NBC, I'm not going to let them off the hook here because I've seen too much devastation in all my years to believe the Democrats at all at this point, as you'll see. So um, the line break is also metaphoric for me about for line break at the border. So um, poetry incited me to action. And so there is me in Chalatenango, El Salvador uh, in 1990. A uh, skinny kid uh, in uh, 20-something, somewhat of a dumbass. And it's where, here where I learned uh, the poet warrior tradition. I had, uh, as you will read in my book, I had joined. I, I, seen, I saw a lot of things, including this uh, scene where I, I took a picture of a, an, a, of a brick home where U.S. manufactured bombs and U.S. Manufacture, U.S. trainers uh, Air Force pilots in helicopter pilots trained by the U.S. and uh, using weaponry designed and political protection from the United States to bomb uh, homes of 16 children and their families and their parents. Uh, I've seen, uh, I saw this after the fact in this case, but I saw it during the fact and just after the fact, and I've seen what war is firsthand, which is why I decided, uh, you know, that the Salvadoran government, the, the U.S. backed, was in fact a fascist military dictatorship. And so I was called to join the uh, FMLN guerrillas, as you see the name there. I was, I was a uh, urban commando with the guerrillas during the war. After working in refugee communities, I got sick of what I saw and I decided I wanted to do something. And I've never been out about this until the book. So, I um, mean, I'm still kind of shy about it because it's been a secret I've held for 30 years in my, in, you know, and then, and then clandestinely during the war, you kind of have all this trauma and uh, just a culture of silence that I also connect to the silence in our families. Like my father, like the state beat me and humiliated me. And it's a story of how I learned to love my father as much as the story of how to challenge La Patria when La Patria is a fascist military dictatorship backed by the United States. So, uh, can somebody read this for me so I can, is that all right, Jonathan? Or, if somebody read it for me? Yeah. Okay, good. Can somebody quickly read this for me? Yeah. 
it's my Ars Poetica, my, my, my ideas about poetry for today. What I mean by poetry is not limited to the, is that what you want me to yeah. mean? Okay. It's not limited to the navel gazing bullshit written by liberal Democrats, do nothings, often awarded big literary prices. Poetry begins in the humility of your body and breath and breathing heart and then ripples outward onto the page and hopefully into the terribly troubled world in need of your poetic truth. In the words of a great Cuban trabador, the poem is you. Si el poema eres tú. You are the poem. So my idea of poetry doesn't follow the things that get literary prizes and institutional backing and big funding and all that. Mine comes from a different tradition and uh, it includes all of us. And the poetic is, is you, it's your body, it's your breath, it's things with a rhythm, it's things that inspire you, it's things that are true to you. And so with this um, sensibility is what I learned is also that poetry is not separate from politics, which in the United States, it, it generally is. You don't get prizes, for example, between 2008 and 2016 if you criticize Barack Obama. Not a single major winner of any literary prize criticized Obama about anything. So either Obama was perfect or there's something about politics and poetry in this country that is uh, different from America Latina in many ways. And so, um, you know, you know. so moving along, what, what's the first thing you think of when you think of Guerrilla camps. Anyone? War. War? Okay. Macho man warriors? Macho man warriors? Yeah, the bandoleros, the traditional. We had those. Um, so today, these women I met during the war, they were young women whose families had been killed and they had no choice but to either flee or to fight against the people that killed their family. That was kind of what makes, what makes a guerrilla is not Karl Marx and, and, and that ideology. It's real lived experience of uh, life and death and poverty and extreme poverty and, and, and the pursuit of justice that's often inspired by dire conditions. So does anybody think of dancing perhaps when you think of guerrilla camps? We danced. I like Emma, Go what did Emma Goldman say? If you can't dance, what is she, if, 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 there, if you can't dance in your revolution, I don't want to be a part of it or something. <laughs> so that, you know, I, 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 you know we, we mostly live in a world and in a country where the imagination about the revolutionary is, is colored by capitalist interest, basically. And it's reported as terrorists, it's reported as many different things except what it actually is at least from what I've seen in the case of El Salvador. So, also there was a lot of poetry and literature. A lot of us read poetry in clandestine safe houses and in the guerrilla camps and wrote it and um, were inspired by it and they were never separate. And so, you know, you know, we had like quotes like that beautiful quote, La poesía como el pan es de todos. Poetry, like bread, is everybody's. So now a brief story of why I'm thinking about this poet warrior tradition. Um, there was a friend of mine, he was a commander during the war, and he and, his, and his, uh, his unit were surrounded by the Salvadoran military. And all reports were that they were going to guarantee to die, the whole unit. And so my friend is like, you know, I talked to him after the fact, and he's like, I said, hey, man, what did you do? He says, well, shit, man, I had to think of a way to get my tropa animated enough to fight like they've never fought before. So what did he do? He, he went to the story. He went to literature. He went, he told a story. He told a story that, you know, reports are that there is a an opening and a weak spot in our enemies, uh, kind of encircling of us over there. Now, there's no guarantee any of us or most of us may even live, but our one hope is that we 
go there and we fight like we've never fought before. And his troops rose up to the occasion and they managed to get through with most of, not all, the troops alive. Guaranteed to die because of the encirclement and the, the, the intensity of the attack on them. And so it, it's a reflection of what I see as the poet poetry. We, we all are animated by stories. Whether we're liberal, conservative, fascist, revolutionary, there are stories at play. There's, I would say, I call it a war of dreams that's at work right now with the decadence of the American dream, in particular, which is extremely dangerous, like a caged, dying animal. So, so I'm now going to talk a little bit about uh, the poet warrior tradition in Spanish and now what. But Judith, we started um, like about six minutes after, so I can go six minutes. I'm just looking at my time, and I want to respect people's Time and attention. Is that okay, Hepa? All right, thank you. So, um, so you know, the tradition as I see it goes back to pre-Columbian era, like Nessa uh, Wakoyo, a great warrior poet of um, the Mexica peoples, um, and and a really outstanding poet. And by the way, when I'm talking about poetry and warrior poet, I'm not talking about people that do war and just kind of maybe sort of write poetry, but I'm talking about people that really can write well. Because I don't teach and I don't promote any ideas to write okay or mediocre. I promote excellence in the word and in action, right? I think that's how we have to kind of face the world that you young people especially are inheriting right now. So it's, a, it's an ancient tradition. You have people like, more recently, Giaconda Belli. Um, um, from Nicaragua, who wrote The Country Under My Skin, and she was a, a guerrilla fighter who, uh, you know, did a lot of intrepid and bold actions and is an outstanding writer. And uh, anybody uh, want to read, for example, something she said, something she wrote, please? Quickly. All right, please. There to change the world. There's nothing uh, exotic mm -hmm. or romantic in wanting to change the world. It is possible. It is the age-old vocation of all humanity. I can't think of a better life than one dedicated to passion, to dreams, to the stubbornness that defies chaos and disillusionment. Thank you. So, Yoconda uh, was a primo poet writer, is a primo writer and poet, and was a primo fighter. And the Nicaraguans really, in the late modern, in the late part of the 20th century, really did a major innovations in what I call the poet warrior tradition, where they were teaching literacy and writing and literature uh, using what is known as popular education techniques, educación popular, where you take reality and you help people learn to read and write, but also to read their world and to then act upon it. What a concept. <laughs> uh, so I've always seen my kind of mission since I've learned about this to, is to translate it into the English language, into this country, as part of the Americas. I see many of us here as kind of the northern front of the insurgent continent of America. So that's kind of my, my shtick as you're getting, I hope. So one of my great inspirations, another one of my great inspirations is Roque Dalton, one of, one of the greatest poet warriors of America, of America Latina, admired by Pablo Neruda, Galeano, countless Cortázar, and other, other, other writers. Um, and he was also a, a guerrillero. He would write poetry clandestinely and seek safe houses in, you know, in, in, in the mountains and in Cuba and et cetera. And, uh, you know, he, made, he was El Salvador's greatest poet, hands down, um, and loved by you know, but even right-wingers love Roque Dalton. And he was the one that I quoted earlier, el, el, la poesía como el pan es de todos. The poetry like bread is belongs to everyone, is everyone's. I'm going to move fast because um, I want, I'm looking at the time and I want to make sure I respect the time. Um, here you have the group that was formed uh, called La Masacuata. And La Masacuata was like a, 
a writer's poets collective that actually be formed a political military organization known as the National Resistance, La Resistencia Nacional, one of the five major groups of the of the guerrilla army that was the FMLN. And uh, so it was so you have a guerrilla organization founded by poets. This is the kind of culture that kind of just inspired me, a US born kid from San Francisco, didn't know what the hell I was getting into. Um, and it wasn't all great and beautiful. I don't want to paint a romantic and fake idea. It's uh, I'm got a lot of scars and I've done a lot of therapy over years to kind of work through things. And writing this book was a major part of that. There's La Masacuata. So let me tell you a little about Unforgetting and translate the poet warrior tradition in the English language. It's my best effort to kind of do what I'm talking about, which is share what I've learned from the Americas in Spanish and translate it into English. So there's a little bit of some of the stories in the book. I go into all these different underworlds, the underworlds of the gangs. I met top leadership in their clandestine hideouts, gone to regions where they were fighting it out with tanks and grenades and semi-automatic weapons, um, gone to the grave sites where they left people, uh, as you see in the... I've also gone to the border and here in the southwest to see the, um, the bodies of people pushed to their death by border militarization. Um, and, you know, I, there's, there's kind of me at, at a forensics lab, and there's my dad. I also go into the underworld of my father and his history. He, my dad was, uh, he is, he's 99 years old, he's still alive. And he harbored this immense secret that you'll find out if you read the book. It's colossally in my life, and I think beyond my life, it's a huge deal because he's one of the last living persons to have experienced something in the world that few people are alive that saw it. So um, and there's kind of like my, my, my fake ID that I had as an urban commando. Uh, I had hair, as you'll see, that was real. My hair was real. I did have hair at the time. Um, but let me, the, the book will be easier to talk about if I, um, if I go to a video. Ready? All right, here we go. Oh. Hi, my name is Roberto Lovato, journalist and author of Unforgetting a reported memoir excavating the real American dirt beneath headlines about MS-13, caged Central American children, and the humanitarian crisis of immigration. Headlines in which the voices of Central Americans in the United States have been silenced and forgotten. Unforgetting is also about an underworld journey, my journey across the cities, forests, and deserts of the 2,500-mile chain of forgotten, dead, and devalued life that begins in El Salvador, where I visit mass graves, morgues, and hideouts where gangs and governments have killed, dismembered, and disappeared their victims for decades. Along the way, I encounter gang leaders, death squad operatives, and guerrilleras who reveal their sometimes startling truths. Unforgetting also chronicles my inward journey to find the stories of revolutionary hope, poetic imagination, and the tenderness that survives the terror. Unforgetting also leads me to Los Angeles, the birthplace of the gangs that would later be exploited for political gain. Eventually, I return to my birthplace, San Francisco's Mission District, to the stories of my immigrant family, including those of my father, Ramon, who bore the astonishing secret that would alter my life. I'd like to invite you on this journey towards forgotten love and healing that we must all take if we are to face the crises of our time. Please join me in the adventure of Unforgetting. States, silence and forgotten. 
Unforgetting would also run the first world journey. My journey across the cities, the forests, and deserts, the 2,500 mile chain of forgotten, dead, devalued life that begins in El Salvador, where I visit mass graves, morgues, and hideouts where gangs and government killed, dismembered, and disappeared their victims for decades. Along the way, I become a grandmother, dead white operative, and dead to yellow to reveal the sometimes startling truth. Unforgetting also chronicles my inward journey to find the stories of revolutionary hope and the tenderness that survives the terror. Unforgetting also leads me to Los Angeles, the birthplace of the gangs that would later be exploited for political gain. Eventually, I return to my birthplace, to the stories of my immigrant family, including those of my father and mother, who bore the astonishing secret that they had in my life. I'd like to invite you on this journey towards forgotten love and healing that we must all take if we are faced with questions of our time. Please join me in the adventure of unforgetting. So that was put together by me and some friends, um, not my publisher. So. All right, you the man. <laughs> so, uh oh, okay, there we go. Is it there? Yeah. All right. So the book is also about my life as a fire that destroys illusions. That's my tattoo that I carry right here. My, I put it up here because I didn't want to. If I put it here, there would be, you'd be identified, profiled, and treated like a gang member and whatnot in Salvador. So I, I've got it here, actually here in New Mexico, in in uh, Santa Fe, where my brother lives. It's anybody know who that is? Huh? Agni? Uh -uh. Shiva, the god of creation and destruction, helped me to resolve the fury that I had as a child. And, you know, I was kind of criminalizing the family. I was the black sheep, rebellious. I was not quiet. And they, they kind of like criminalized me in the family, which our parents can do, like the state. And so, when I discovered Shiva, I was just like, damn, that's so cool, because the destructive power that we have is connected to our creative power. And it helped me become, I think, a more balanced person, especially at the later stages in life. Um, so my life, the book's about my life as a fire that destroys illusions. And my book in, is a fire that destroys illusions of history that border us off from the tear and the tenderness of our, of our truths. That's kind of what my mission in writing the book was. So there you have my family there on the left. Um, and pictures you've already seen. And the guy there in the military outfit is General Hernandez Martinez, the dictator responsible for the, what scholars at Oxford told me is the single most violent episode, perhaps in world history, as far as the numbers of people killed per day, per week, in a concentrated space and time. El Salvador, 1932. And um, there's the, some of the bodies of pictures. that This whole, this whole history was erased. And so that's why another reason I called my book and my journey Unforgetting. So coming back to the border, does anybody want to guess what makes this possible? Caging children, imprisoning them, what makes it possible? That's one. What else? There's economic interests, but to do it to children, what do you got to do? Boom. Dehumanize them. That's why I put his back there. But this is taken like in a car in prison where I visited. This isn't my picture, but I visited Carnes in 2014 and 15 during the Obama administration, which in fact started the country on the path to caging uh, thousands, tens of thousands of children and mothers, right, uh, with the help of Janet Napolitano and then Jay Johnson, the heads of Homeland Security. The practice began with the Democrats and um, was extended, expanded, and worsened under Trump. And now, according to lawyers I just talked to this week who are working with these families and people, conditions in the prisons are worse now than they were under Trump. Okay, if you believe that. So um, what makes it possible is erasure. 
you know, which joins racism, homophobia, misogyny, classism, and other isms to make humans inhuman and vulnerable. I can't, one thing I learned in El Salvador was that you can't kill somebody unless you take away their humanity. So when you see like somebody on TV, please don't kill me, I'm a father, I'm a mother, you know, I have kids. That's real. It's hard. There's something in the human species that makes it difficult to kill a fellow human being. And uh, that's why you have police academies and uh, racist training in police academies. They tell you things about black people, brown people, poor people. And the sad thing is you got black, brown, poor people being some of the ones doing the executing. executing. So, um, yeah, I... So one of the major reasons I wrote the book was to counter the extreme erasure of Central Americans from our own story. This is a story I did in 2015, I think, or something. But it was um, looking at the fact that in all the coverage, two volunteers and I looked at all the coverage of the Trump, in 2018, of the Trump, remember when all these cities were protesting Trump? They were organized by a Democratic Party front group called Families Belong Together. They're not organic coming out of the Central American community, which has been on this issue for decades, they actually created a front group, AstroTurf, to protest Trump and create a false history that erased Obama from the responsibility for this. So one of the ways you do that is you don't include the people in the story who actually been on the story for 30 years, Central Americans. So the volunteers and I looked at all the coverage on CNN, Washington Post, New York Times, MSNBC, not a single Centro Americana or Centro American in the story, even though Homeland Security statistics will tell you at that time that most of the people, children and mothers being imprisoned were Honduran, Guatemalan, or Salvadoran. So you didn't see me much on MSNBC. <laughs> um, and so I documented for the Columbia Journalism Review. Um, and so I, I wrote, this inspired me to write the book. I, I already had the book in mind, but I was getting more bothered and kind of pissed off, to be frank, that we were erased from our own stories. So given that, how did I survive what I've seen? A little bit of, you know, what keeps me going? What helps Salvadorans and others of us face dire, cataclysmic situations like war, genocide, in the case of Guatemala, mass murder, gang wars, extreme violence? What, well, one of the things is, Poetry and the poetic, but not in the terms of like literary prizes in that game, but more um, in the poet warrior sense that I'm talking about. Um, and, and can somebody read what that says or translate it for us? What does that mean? I didn't know it was impossible, so I did it. I feel like that's been a little bit of the life that we've led. I didn't know it was impossible to go across 30 years and 2,500 miles of mass graves, war, genocide in the case of Guatemala, gang violence throughout the region, narco violence that I saw in, in Mexico, and stuff here in the U.S. I didn't know it was impossible. I kind of just did it. And I was inspired by the people that I met along the way, which is kind of what the book's about. Not kind of, it is what the book's about. So what is war warriorship? It challenges the illusion of the border wall between literature and politics that keeps us these two as separate pursuits. You're taught in universities like this one that poetry's over there, politics is over there, the two shall not meet, you know, because Moses and the Ten Commandments have them separate like that. Red Sea. Port Warship prioritizes the visionary where mainstream thought prioritizes the decadent illusion of a long existing order, the idea of history that you're taught, and the idea that it cannot be changed. Right? That idea is fundamental to domination. You can ask the black community in the United States and black history in the United States, our most important uh, historical political tradition in my estimation that any semblance of democracy has been brought about because of the black struggle here. So, I mean, now others of us are contributing. I'm not, you know, going to make myself an object and incapable, but we have to recognize the history that's, that, we, that, that guides us here, but also in America Latina. So, yeah, the visionary is 
big part of the Port Warrior tradition. So can somebody read this real quick? This organization of the census, what the hell is that about? This organization of the census, any literature, literature professors here, students? No. What does that mean? What do you think that means? Your senses are being organized. By who? Capitalism, by the state. Your senses, literally, especially with social media. This was written in the 19th century by this guy, Arthur Cambo. He wrote it either during or right after the Paris Commune, after the bombing of the Paris Commune. So he saw the way the bombs, you know how I was talking about the Border Patrol as a communications force? Bombs, guns are as much about communicating something as they are about killing. Does that make sense? Because what happens when the death squads leave a dead body and leave it in the most barbaric way, visible to the community? What is that? Is that solely a violent act? It's an act of communication. Because why? Why would that be? Huh? A threat. You want to be like that? Don't get involved. That's the message of the state. So Hambo understood this as a poet. And he says the job of the poet is to disorganize the census. So you as professors, if you're really going to be honest with your students, are about disorganizing their census about certain things that they've been taught in their history, in their bodies, the disciplining of their sexuality, and other parts of their identity. And so poor warriors should prioritize the visionary where mainstream thought prioritizes the illusion of an existing order and that it cannot be changed. Is this map right or wrong? Let me ask the student. Are you a student? Is this map right or wrong? It's upside down. Anybody have a different opinion? Huh? What does that mean? So is it right or wrong? Mm -hmm. Yeah, depends if you want to be right or wrong. The idea that the United States is above the Americas, is, is, is that God created? Did science create that? No. No. There's no God that created that. There's no science that can justify this as a fact. These are arbitrary, not necessary. If you're into logic and philosophy like I was as a geek in Berkeley. So I was kind of aspiring to this when I started doing the cover for my book. Initially, it was this was one of them, right? Because I want to disorganize people's senses about things like nations and identities that are based on nations and racial identity and other things, all constructs. I ended up with this other one for reasons I can talk about over coffee or something, but poet worship is at, at, at once anti-capitalist at its core, right? The great poet warriors that I've known have been you know, unequivocally, unapologetically anti-capitalist. And I think anybody concerned about the state of the planet and climate change in particular has to be in their heart of hearts and their minds anti-capitalist at this point in world history. Socialism didn't destroy the climate that now threatens and has killed countless species and is forcing migration and destroying large swaths of the planet. It was capitalism that brought us to this brink of disaster. And poet worship connects, makes a connection between bold acts of imagination and physical acts of great power and imagination. Anybody remember this? Those young dreamers that crossed the border challenging the Obama administration to deport them. And when they came back in, because you know, they, they, they didn't have documents, they went on the other side to Mexico and Obama didn't, you know, Obama flinched. So they successfully got, came back into the country. A very bold action that brought attention to their cause. And I would say that was a those poetic action in terms of just how bold and visionary it was to be able to do that. 
You see the same thing in the civil rights movement when, you know, whether it's King or SNCC or the Panthers in particular, you know, taking up arms and, 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 and just walking in the face of the man and saying, hey, man, we are going to bear arms too. So um, I, 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 I uh, not moving on, just to wind down real quick. Uh, I want to talk about folks that I see reflecting the poet warrior tradition here in the United States in the English language. My former teacher, June Jordan. Poetry is a political act because it involves telling the truth. So if you tell the truth, you're a poet. El poeta eres tú. You know, and June taught that. And she also taught what I call popular education so that you would go into San Francisco's mission or part of Oakland and you would go and teach workers about reading and writing and poetry. So then they would go and teach somebody else, which is a model that she studied with, you know, here in the US, but also in Nicaragua, from Nicaragua and then the Nicaraguan Revolution that really did a lot, like Jaconda Belli, who I mentioned. Adrian Rich, another Bay Area person. I'm sorry, I'm Bay Area centric. <laughs> we can duke it out later. We could talk about other Southwestern poets who are there, but, but when poetry lays its hands on our shoulder, we are, to an almost physical degree, touched and moved, touched and moved. The imagination's roads open before us, giving the lie to that brute dictum, there is no alternative. So when you feel there's no hope, even at a moment like this, you have brought hook, line, and sinker, the messages created for you by what used to be called the man. I mean, I'm, some, most of you are not old enough to remember, I mean, I'm not going to say who's nodding their head here about recognizing it, but um, yeah, when, when you believe that there's no, there's no hope and there's no way to change things, then you've swallowed the, the blue pill in the matrix. <laughs> Another person I, I adore and uh, for being a poet warrior is Audre Lorde. And, 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 and if you look at Audre Lorde or Adrian Rich or uh, June, you're talking about writers, poets who are integrally linked to the social movements of their times. Always. They didn't see that distinction that wins you a prize because most of the people winning prizes now, you know, um, uh, are, are, are not really linked to social movements. I, I'm a geek about these things. I kind of look at who gets prizes and what they say in public and who they're, who they're hooked up with in the, in the political community. And no, no, you know, they're, they're hooked, they're, they're, their Che Guevara dream is like the Democratic, the liberal flank of the Democratic Party, the Obama, Biden, Clinton flank. As long as you don't criticize them, you'll get a prize. So caring for myself is not in self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. So closing thoughts. Why is the poet warrior tradition important at this moment in history? Why? according to what I've been trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. We need the political imagination that transcends the false realities we're being fed. And because you, me, we all are at the start of a war of dreams that will determine the fate of humanity. This ain't no joke. I've been around this world. I've been at war. I've been to the deepest, darkest places. I've, I, I can imagine that I wouldn't imagine my stepson or anyone going to ever. But this is no joke. We are in a truly, truly the fight of our lives. And we're not acting like it. We're buying into kind of the... The, 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 the kind of things will be okay once we get Trump out idea didn't happen so a sustainable planet demands a sustainable struggle and a sustainable individual and collective struggle and so for me this tradition I've been sharing to you with you and that I've been a part of has been what sustained and what continues to sustain me through extreme violence and terror and devastation that I've seen it sustains me, and I don't have a bullet in my head because I have a, my imagination is alive and my heart is alive to pump blood into it and make action happen. So 
with that, I say sustainable me makes for a sustainable us. And as Audre Lorde said, survival is life after disaster, life in honor of our ancestors. Despite the genocidal forces working against them, specifically so we could not exist. So, con esa me despido, gracias. Absolutely, uh, whoever, as long as, I mean, you can hate me if you want, that's fine. I'm, you have criticism, if you have questions. We have comments from uh, Dr. Dulcinea Lara. Uh, earlier, to, earlier, she said, she quoted, I don't roll with the untruth of any tradition. Love that, the unforgetting. <laughs> then she said, uh, quote, destroy the border, illusions in our minds. Thank you for your poetry theory. Uh, she also said, my nine-year-old just said, slash asked, quotation marks, Michelle Obama's husband really did that to immigrants. <laughs> then uh, me, Mikhail Rolf, true, true love, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, history as a production construct itself. And last one, ideological state appar apparatuses, uh, El Althusser. Althusser, Louis Althusser. Althusser. Yeah. I love Louis Althusser. Hmm. Yes, yes, Michelle Obama's husband did do that, unfortunately. I'm sorry. And Michelle said she cared a lot about kids, but never said a single fucking word about those kids, those thousands of children, her husband, imprisoned and separated from their mothers. I visited them. I saw their tears. I saw their terror. And I saw the silence in the White House. I saw it in Trump, and I see it with oh, Biden, too, just to be clear. I don't. When the first Hispanic president comes up, I guarantee you I'll be the first one to throw what I throw at them. What's your next book? Well, good question. It was going to be Letters to a Young Poet Warrior, which I think I mentioned, right? But I've suffered a series of rejections in the official literary world in terms as, as represented by fellowships, grants, residencies, you know, recognitions, etc. All of my proposals have been rejected. Even though the book critically has done really well, one of the country's preeminent poets is the one who said all these beautiful things about my book in the New York Times. But there's, we're at a moment where uh, Latinx people are not exactly in the center of the national narrative. You can look in your films, you can look at your literature. Only 1% of books in the United States are by Latinx peoples. And um, you can look at Sunday talk shows. We don't get to talk about immigration even. So, um, so then on top of that, I'm not just brown, but I'm also former revolutionary urban commando in a part of U.S.-backed fascist military dictatorship. Not exactly the kind of stuff you're going to see on Terry Gross and NPR. You know? Hey, Roberto, tell us about being an urban commando. No, that, you don't get that. Just like you wouldn't see the Black Panthers kind of in certain circles. You wouldn't see people from the left generally embraced by the official normalizing ideological state apparatus that was quoted by whoever said that. So given that, I've made a switch. I have another book that I already started, which this is about like my mom, my dad, my dad and me. My next book is about my mom. My mom as a, my mom was a, you know, in her union, loyal, raised a family with a, kind of an emotionally absent father who was alcoholic and uh, was always connected to the homeland and taught us to love the homeland. And as one of the most, it's, no, it's the single most beautiful person I'll, I'll ever know in, of any depth like that. And she introduced me to this glorious bird known as a scarlet macaw. So after my mom died, I, 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 I needed to search for her spirit. And I went to that bird. I started following that bird in Venezuela in uh, other parts of the Americas, and uh, I even went to Spain because of the way the Spaniards took the bird and turned it into a, from a three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional object put on maps. Like the Portuguese wouldn't call America. Instead of, if the Portuguese would have won the big battle between Spain and um, Portugal, we'd be here in La Tierra del Papagayo, the land of the macaw. 
because that was what they were going to name it. America was the kind of Spanish, you know, version of an Italian discoverer that a German map made, cartographer kind of decided to put on. So, this is, so I want to I want to kind of tell the story of this my mom and this glorious bird that you can find their bones in Zuni Pueblo. You, I went to Chihuahua to areas where the Juarez cartel and the uh, Sinaloa cartel are battling out for the drug routes. Um, and, and in these areas, that's where you, they found the bones of 500 macaws in the desert. What the hell is those birds doing there? So, that's a little, so my mom and that bird have a deep connection in my mind and heart. And so I'm exploring it by traveling around the world in search of that bird to find my mom. This is how we roll, you know, I'm crazy. Other we have, questions? We have another question from Facebook. What keeps you going? What sustains you? Any type of self-care? Fuck, man, I just did a yeah. hour and change presentation on that, man. No, I'm kidding. What sustains me? Well, first of all, I I uh, think like Audrey Lord taught us and others, you have to... You know, I mean, I, when I talk to students sometimes, I say, hey, man, how many of you all want to be dangerous in a system that is this oppressive? Is it necessary to be dangerous in a system that's I would argue yes. So if you want to be dangerous in a disease system, what can you do to be dangerous? Be healthy. If you're truly healthy, if you really are with, in tune with your emotions, with your spirit, with your mind and your body, then the, the lies of this system will not rest in you and root themselves in you if you're more in a dysfunctional mode and unhealthy and kind of off your game, but if you're at the top of your game. So health is number uno. It's the alpha and the omega, really. We have to, we have to think about a sustainable struggle. I have sustained myself by... Like my sister-in-law just said, you know, you're kind of like, and my sister-in-law's onto this Aztec stuff. She says, you're, you're kind of like into the Tezcatlipolca tradition. I go, what do you mean? Well, Tezcatlipolca is about going into the deep, dark places and coming out with the difficult truths. And she, read, she said that after she heard me talking about the book. I was like, hey, that, that could be me. Yeah, so I think to be healthy, especially at a moment like this, you have to go into the underworld. The, the upper world that we inhabit is just massive lies. These machines, our governments, media, social media, all, all these systems are just layers of lies. So in times of crisis, history shows us that people go into the under, different undergrounds, underworlds, to kind of... So I, I, I'm one that goes into the dark places, and I do it as an act of health. I feel healthier not looking away from the world. I think it's unhealthy to un not look at the world as difficult as it is. The world's harder to look at, but my health demands that I look at it in doses <laughs> and, you know, with medications that, as a good Californian, I can talk about over dinner or something. I have an article for the New York Times, if I may, if I may be frank. I had an article I was writing for the New York Times about uh, psychedelics. 40 years. Doing it's like I've been an explorer of consciousness as a good Californian, literally. No, I have. I've done it as a with a scientific exploratory attitude, because I believe. I mean, Johns Hopkins and all these major universities around the world are now telling us that the most powerful medicine for dealing with trauma, for example, or alcoholism, psychedelics, microdosing, macrodosing under the guidance of a therapist. I've done that too. I've also I also meditate. It's a good question. I have another question. As we work to create new educational systems, is there a need to wrestle with the oppressed becoming the oppressors concepts? Mm -hmm. That's a great one. You gotta be careful with that one though. Because that's there's a truth in it. There's also the manipulation of that by the powers that be. Like when the powers that be talk about revolutionary movements, they'll always tell you that when they get the power, they get corrupt. It's not entirely true. That might read on history. Uh, it has happened. It happened with the group I belong to, the FMLN. There were people that got corrupted and took the FMLN in a... And I documented it. They, FMLN police forced me to erase my pictures at gunpoint of mass graves, for example. 
to my ex compañeros, but that was some people in the leadership. That wasn't all the former revolutionaries that I've known. They're still some of the noblest, most powerful people I will ever meet. People that, you know, people that will risk their lives for you and with you, right? That's love. That's love. Love is not. You know, love is not just being with myself. Love is extending myself to another. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think we do have to wrestle with that. I think, like somebody asked last night at an event, asked me about the nonprofit sector and social change. I said, no, the two are separate. <laughs> at this stage in history, the nonprofit sector is a good thing, a nice, a good service, and what, but it's not about social change at this point in history. I don't believe. I think we... We've, our, our systems of finance foundations and others have been so fabulously corrupted that um, we need to develop autonomous parallel structures that are not able to be manipulated by the powers that be. I mean, you guys have a power free space here at the university, right? There's no power games here. I'm kidding. You know, but yeah, I, I think it's, so it's a, it's, a, it's a truism, but it's also a truism that's used by the powers that be to continue their game to deflect. Let me get out. Are you talking about doing it through the school systems? <laughs> I think we need to create. I think literacy is critical. I think we need. I think we need a new kind of literacy, though, because. You know, anybody remember Jacques Ellul, theorist of media, French priest? Brilliant, great book. I'd highly recommend. He had a book called The Humiliation of the Word, written in the 60s. The word has been humiliated, right? People don't want to listen to my poet warrior crap. They want to watch a video. You know, they want to, like, see an image. They want a social media share. Thank you for coming. Um, so we are at a time where we're challenged. Literacy is, has to be redefined, I think, to include media literacy. Teach people to critically read the media. You know, and then kind of, oh, by the way, there's other things called alphabets and words and stories and letters that come together, but that's one thing. I think creating autonomous parallel structures that pressure the school systems to, to become more visionary in what they do rather than be ideological state apparatus like, Althusser talks about, or Gramsci will talk about, right? That, you know, you have these systems that are just normalizing existing order so that the powers that be stay the powers that be in a very simple form, right? So I, I, I really think, I still believe we're just getting out. I mean, we all began poetry by listening to our heartbeats, listening to our breath, feeling, and then getting around a fire with other people and became what we now call poetry. We didn't need these award-winning institutions and all this stuff. We have to kind of decentralize and kind of hack away at the existing literary order, the, the existing order that defines literacy. I think that's that's how it's, I mean, we're watching, we, I'm writing, I don't know if it's clear from what I'm saying, but I've seen the United States go from being the great empire to become Latino Americanizado, Latin Americanized. In terms of the division between rich and poor, we've become, we've surpassed Peru and other Latin American countries in terms of the division between rich and poor. And so as the United States, are dying, we're also seeing fascistic, militaristic um, structures, that political parties, political figures, homeland security, you know, customs and border patrol. These are fascist. They could become look. Look at what they're doing to the Asian community. That's fascistic, right? It's under guise of cowboys, and so with that kind of a 
uh, those, those are those those smell of Latin America to me because it's such a and so okay so then that this one of the things do you think it was easy for me to come out as having been a former guerrillero? Do you know how hard it was for me to come out about that? When I met you, I didn't tell you that. I did not. I kept that secret for a long time because of national security, because of trauma, because, you know, I've had dealings with militaries and with, actually, to be frank, the CIA. The, and so, um, yeah, I've had another story in another book. But uh, it was hard for me to come out, but... I decided, hey, the United States is becoming a Latin American country from the top down. So I better share what I know, how to act in a Latin American country that the United States is becoming. That's kind of the thesis that guides my work right now. We have another question. Are you still involved uh, with Dignidad Literaria? And if so, what is the group working on right now? For those that don't know, Dignidad Literaria was a movement that Miriam Gerba, David Bowles, and I started after David and Miriam criticized that book, American Dirt. So they, they wrote a great critique about it. And the organizer in me said, hey, man, that's interesting. Let's take the, and they started getting all that energy and focusing on this white woman, Janine Cummins. So then I said, hey, why don't we take this energy and focus it where it belongs? On the institution that makes this white woman's garbage book possible. So then we did it, and Macmillan Publisher, one of the biggest in the, country kind of bowed before our demands and agreed to, you know, some of our demands on them. And so uh, we started that, and then what happened? COVID-19. Slowed down the pace and the, the rhythm of what we were doing, and uh, we put a pause on it. But some, if it's not Dignidad Literaria, some form of that will be resurrected to again confront the literary powers that be so coming to a new york publishing industry soon we'll see you soon i promise there's kind of a question here i don't know if you want to ask that. please alex i don't buy it la niña Casi no se te oye. A little louder, please. Uh -huh. From where? Okay. I mean, in, in, in a very general way, yeah, guerrilla is a, you know, is a, a non-traditional military structure. It's a people's army, right? So in Latin America, when the U.S., supported military dictatorships everywhere in the Americas, except Mexico, right, which didn't really have a, a military structure like the rest of the Americas, Dominican Republic, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Colombia, Brazil, and tens of hundreds of thousands of dead killed by these governments. Um, yeah, so you saw, in response, you saw these people's armies come up some of whom were visionary and beautiful and powerful in their day, some of which were not. Some of which were kind of deformed, in my opinion, deformed ideas. Uh, so even the FMLN that I belong to, the one in the book at the beginning, uh, early on, is is the one that, I, that changed my life. The one that today is not the one. It became a political party, and it took on a different... You see similar things here where you know, there was a time when the Democratic Party had a link to labor. You know, they weren't a guerrilla organization, but they were more committed to working class people instead of communicating to middle and upper class people. So it was similar. I haven't seen the novel. I'd have to see it. Is, 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 she, a, is she How is she the little girl painted? Or a woman or young woman or a little girl? Yeah, child soldier. That's a big problem in the world, you know, where traditional militaries and guerrilla organizations are using children. Oh, 
I'll check it out. I'm curious now. Thank you. Just wondering how long it took you to write uh, the unforgettable. Yeah, I'm, I'm forgetting. Excellent question. It's a writer's question. Um, how long did it take? It I wrote it. Mm, I researched it and wrote it in about three plus years, and then, you know, all the kind of last final editing and kind of prepping the type and all that and copy, um, year and a half. Uh, but the question of was it difficult? I, in writing this book, I did the wisest thing I think I've ever done as a writer. Uh, anticipating that all these family secrets, all these filet mignon of trauma that I carried in my stomach for so long, all the terror that I've seen in children, mothers, families, in El Salvador, in Guatemala, in Mexico, in the United States, my dad beating my ass and humiliating me, that's all in there and more. The wisest thing I did was think, man, you know what? This is going to open up not just one Pandora's box, but several. I better get a therapist. And I got a therapist, and we mapped out the emotional terrain, paso a paso, chapter by chapter, so that I didn't have to just be overwhelmed. Because you have to be mindful of how much you can actually take. You got to know your limits. You got to know when to put a pause. So my therapist was this turned out to be the son of a Holocaust survivor to boot, which was a gift from the literary and traumatic gods of the world. To me, it's like, damn, man, this person whose family experience was related to the genocide in, in Nazi Germany and is, is helping me walk through my own personal hell. So I also want to say the book is not all just as you saw, it's not just heavy and bad stuff. It's inspiring stuff that is the reason I don't have a bullet in my head. Because like, my brother can tell you, I felt like taking myself out previously. But I, I, you know, speaking of self-care, I think love and family, when they work, can be just everything to, to survival. So, um, yeah, I, it was a difficult journey. But I, the wisest thing I ever did, I don't know how the hell I did, but I said, I'm going to map this out. I'm going to get a therapist. So if you're a writer and you're thinking about opening up your own Pandora's boxes that are massive, consider telling your therapist, hey, listen, you're going to help me write this book. Which is what I did. You're going to, that was the, you no, know, because you want to be the one in control with your therapist. You want to tell them how you want to use them. So I told him, you're going to help me write this book. You're going to help me map the emotional terrain and piece by piece, step by step, walk through it. It kind of worked. And I don't recommend people write for catharsis. I think that's bullshit writing. But I, I do know that if you do as honest a effort as you can to go into the dark places that you as a person at this moment in world history are going to have, you're going to come out better by going down into the darkness. And what did like Carl Jung say, you know, sometimes problematic psychologist, he said, the gold is in the dark. So, I leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you. It turned out.